this morning with our opening prayer. Dear Lord and Father, thank you that you promise us that where two or three are gathered, you are there in the midst. Lord, we welcome you among us today and celebrate the gift of life that you have lavished upon each of us. We ask that you would open our ears that we may hear your voice, open our minds so we may receive your eternal wisdom, open our spirits so that we may know your leading and guidance, and open our hearts so that we may receive your wonderful love. We ask all this in the glorious name of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand again as we sing our opening hymn, 277. Christians, we have met to worship. Let us stand as we sing hymn, 277. Would you please join me in prayer? Righteous Father, King of heaven, we, your children, are gathered here today. We are those called by your name. We are alive to praise and worship you. We come to fulfill our purpose on earth, accept our thanksgiving in Jesus' name. In your presence, O oh Lord, there is fullness of joy. Fill us with your overwhelming joy. Strengthen us in you that we would remain standing even during the storms that we may be counted with. Go with us, Lord, and make our gathering today successful. Thank you for answered prayers. Would you please join me in saying the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If our children would like to meet me in the back.
the scripture we're going to read today is a bit difficult. It's a bit difficult, not because of the words necessarily that are part of the scripture. I'm going to trip over the pronunciation of these words a whole lot less than I do many other scriptures. But it's difficult because it makes you see Jesus in a different light. Jesus will say and do things that I don't necessarily believe he should. Jesus will do things that if I were to do them, you would rightfully question me. In fact, we have many school teachers here. If a high school or middle school student acted the way that Jesus acts in this scripture, they would get suspended or a referral. But that doesn't mean there's not something for us to learn from, not something deeper at play, not a reason why Jesus acts the way he does. So let us read our scripture from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 15, verse 22 through 28. A Canaanite woman from the vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, Send her away. She keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. The word of the Lord. I think you can see um, some of the problems I find with Jesus' actions in this text. First, Jesus ignores this woman based only on the fact that she's a Canaanite, that her ethnicity is not Jewish. I uh, watched a video earlier this week, and maybe you watched it too. It was of a young black girl. Uh, she was three years old, and she was at Chuck E. Cheese. Now, I know what you're thinking. Chuck E. Cheese is still open? Yeah, I assumed that COVID-19 started in a Chuck E. Cheese ball pit, <laughs> but somehow there's a Chuck E. Cheese somewhere. And this young black girl was so excited to see Chuck E. She was jumping up and down saying, Chucky, Chucky, Chucky. And this teenager in a Chuck E. Cheese suit uh, walked past her. Uh, Chucky greeted all the white children one after another, uh, paid attention to each one of them, but he ignored that little girl's request to just see Chucky. Now, the video wasn't long. It was maybe a minute. But you could see this three-year-old girl's face filled with disappointment as Chucky ignored her. This Canaanite woman came to Jesus with a daughter suffering, suffering terribly, and she knew that Jesus was the only one who could fix her problems. Yet Jesus, a lot like that teenager in a Chuck E. Cheese mask, ignored her, walked past didn't listen to her problems, didn't give her the time of day. But then, uh, when she finally uh, made herself known, Jesus turned to her and said, I came here for the children of Israel, not for you dogs. Now, dogs weren't a loving member of your family back then. Uh, dogs were the things that kept the vermin away. Dogs were outside of the house. They weren't the loving sheep. He wasn't their shepherd. Jesus made it clear that this woman was not a human, was not of the same quality as a Jewish person, but she was an animal. Now, 
I'm not the only one who's had trouble with this text. In fact, Christians for thousands of years have grappled with this very text here. Because we, all of us here, for the most part, are not Jewish, are we? No. We're the dogs. We're the people that Jesus referred to not as the children of God, but as the dogs outside of God's love, not welcome at the table. If you go in my office, you'll see a bookshelf. Now, it's not quite as large as several other preachers' bookshelves, um, because a lot of my books are here in my hand right now. But the books I do have on that bookshelf are quite old. And if you look in there, you'll see two bookshelves, one with a series of blue books and one with a series of red books. They are a biblical commentary. I think it's a little odd. Um, my book on the commentary of the Gospel of Matthew is actually larger than most of my Bibles. So people wrote about the Gospel of Matthew longer than the entire Bible. Uh, so this commentary fills this whole shelf, and when you open it up, you see different scholars writing on different passages. And one scholar wrote on these six verses here. Now, that commentary was published in the 1960s. The scholar who wrote particularly on this topic was the most well-respected scholar at the time. He was 80 when this book was published in 1960. He, he published a lot of his work in the 1920s and the 1930s. He, his view is the very traditional view of what this scripture means. And I think it's quite telling what he says. He writes, Jesus was moved by her persistence, humility, and faith, and granted her request. In many ways, Jesus' eyes were opened, as well as his heart, to people outside of the Jewish community. He writes that it's only because of this Canaanite woman that we, all of us here, have a place at Jesus' table. Uh, that this woman's persistence, humility, and faith opened Jesus' hardened heart, right? Um, that the possibility that someone who wasn't Jewish could be a good person. Now, who's seen the movie The Green Book, right? Yeah, it was published, I think, in um, uh, 2019, and it's the story of an Italian from New York City. Yeah, I think it's based in the 1950s or 60s, and he's a bit racist. Uh, the opening bit of the movie shows him and a bunch of other Italians drinking beer and watching sports, and a black man comes into the house to do some repairs. And he gets up after the black man leaves and tells his wife, never hire a black man again. They don't work as hard as us Italians. Now, mind you, all the Italians were drinking beer, and the black man was working, but, but for some reason he didn't like black people. Now, through the process of this movie, he goes on a journey with a black musician through the South. And this black musician, through his humility, his persistence, and his faith, wins over this Italian. And he opens this Italian's heart to the possibility that black people can be good, too. It's a, a feel-good movie. But I have some problems with comparing Jesus to that Italian. Because I can't imagine any point in time in which we, all of us here, were not considered the children of God. I can't imagine that Jesus needed his heart to be opened like Pharaoh or the Grinch to let us in. So I don't really like that interpretation. Now, luckily, that's not the last person to ever write on this scripture. And in one of my commentaries contained here in this tablet, uh, someone writes something a little bit different. Um, according to this more modern scholar, it was Jesus wasn't really racist. He was just testing the woman, right? He was telling her that she was a dog to see if her faith was really strong enough to stay. 
right? If you send her away and you send her away and you send her away, but still she stays, well, then you know she's truly a faithful woman. Now, it may not be a feel-good movie, but maybe a few more people have seen the movie Fight Club. Who's seen Fight Club? A few people, right? Actually, that's more hands than the Green Book. Uh, but in Fight Club, they have this club, right? It's a fight club. And in order to join the club, you have to stand out front of their clubhouse, and you have to be berated several days. If you're skinny, the club came up and say, you're too skinny, go away. Get out of here. You're not going to work in Fight Club. If you're too fat, they tell you you're too fat. Get out. Leave. If you're too black, they tell you you're too black. If you're white, they tell you you're too white. It, it really doesn't matter. Uh, whatever your feature is, they tell you you are not worthy in the hopes that you stay, that you stay and you make it into the club. And maybe that's what Jesus is doing here. But I have some problems with that, too. Because, you know, it works for a movie called Fight Club, but Fight Club isn't the Bible, right? Jesus is supposed to be a perfect person, uh, both fully divine and fully human. Why would he test this woman in ways that he tested no one else? Uh, Peter denied Christ multiple times, but yet Peter was considered the rock of faith. Uh, there was a woman who merely touched Jesus' garment and she was healed. Yet this woman had to beg and beg and beg to have her daughter healed. That just doesn't make any sense to me. Now luckily, people haven't stopped writing on this scripture either. And a more modern view uh, one that was published just a year ago, shows this scripture not by itself, but connect it to the rest of the Bible. Because each one of these commentaries speaks only to these six verses, right? I mean, how many verses are in the entire Bible, right? A lot. Uh, so if we're talking about six verses by themselves, then we miss the whole point of the Gospel of Matthew, or, or the New Testament in general. I spoke only on 22 through 28. But if you look at verse 1 through 22, you'll see something a bit different. So in that previous, in that previous verses, Jesus is challenged by the Pharisees. They say, Jesus, why is it that you and your followers don't wash your hands before you eat, as is the Jewish custom? Now, I recommend that everyone wash their hands before they eat. It has nothing to do with your spiritual health, but your physical health, well, that's useful. Uh, but Jesus said that it's not what puts, we put in our body that makes us unclean but it's what comes out. In particular, Jesus says the words, don't you see whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them. These are the very words before Jesus says things out of his mouth that defile him. This passage is a living parable. It tells you that no matter how good you think you are, it doesn't matter if you've come to church every single day of your life, if you've never missed Sunday school, I don't care if your great, 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 great grand uncle was the Pope. It doesn't matter. The words that come from your mouth can defile you. They can make you unclean, even if you are the son of God. Now, I don't know any Canaanites today, right? I don't think anyone's racist against the Canaanites. But people do say negative things about one another. Um, people have talked about how felons are just animals who don't need to be part of our society. They don't need to vote. 
uh, they've lost that privilege along with their humanity. Or who's heard cops referred to as filthy pigs, right? Uh, who's heard about the wealthy fat cats leeching off of society? Or the poor homeless vagrants who wander the streets like a pack of dogs? We all come with our judgments against other people. We reduce their humanity in the same way that God did, uh, that Jesus did here. The lesson from our scripture today is a simple one. No matter how good you think you are, no matter how clean you think you are, you, based on the words that come from your mouth, can defile yourself and make yourself, like Jesus, unclean. Now, will you pray for me, with me? Almighty God, we thank you. We thank you for being a living parable for us by showing us that we, no matter how perfect we think we might be, can be made unclean based upon our actions and that we need to accept everyone, no matter what we might think about them, as your children because they are truly worthy and deserving of ours and your respect. We, say, we pray all of this in your son's holy and great name. Amen. Let us stand and sing hymn 349. My Jesus, I love thee. Let us stand and sing hymn 349. Before service today, uh, one of our members of the congregation came up to me and she said, Ben, uh, I assumed that you'd be preaching on one of these other two chapters or verses that discuss racism, because racism's found in many places of the Bible. But one of the ones she particularly said was the Good Samaritan. And in it, Jesus shows his disciples and the people around him that they shouldn't open the faith only to the Jewish people, that people like the Samaritans are worthy of love and respect as well. 
Uh, Even though in this one living parable, Jesus seems to dismiss this Canaanite woman, throughout the Bible, Jesus repeatedly opens up the faith to all of the children of God. And in one of the places he does it most clearly is around this table, where he opens this holy communion to all. And today, in, in that same spirit of welcome, we are welcomed here now. For on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread, and having blessed it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat of this, all of you. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in like manner, after supper, he took the cup, and having blessed it, he poured it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, drink of this, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant of my blood given to you for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Lord God, we praise and thank you for your invitation to this table today. Because of your grace, we celebrate communion with you and each other. Help us to be worthy of this, that we may always remember the sacrifice and love of Jesus. In Christ's holy name, amen. And Jesus said, A few weeks ago, eastern Kentucky experienced uh, floods, floods that have devastated large parts of our state, and they are just now starting to rebuild. Um, We, as a church, have given, was it $5,000 to Week of Compassion. That is the disciples' arm that enters disaster zones like this and immediately starts supporting the area in, in the ways that they need to be supported. Today, I would ask if you would like to give an additional donation right on there for Week of Compassion. We will make sure that it gets to them and that it is used to help in eastern Kentucky rebuild those areas. So today, as we listen to our moment of reflection, think about what we can do as a congregation to greater help those neighbors we have here in our home state.
aisle and you have not joined our congregation, then we invite you to come forward today and reaffirm your faith. It's as simple as that. Just reaffirm that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and accept Him as your Lord and Savior. Or, if it's the very first time, we invite you to come down and make that confession today as well as we sing our hymn of response. Let's stand as we sing hymn 701, Shall We Gather at the River? Let's stand as we sing hymn 701. Shall we gather at the Thank you for worshiping with us today. I would like to remind you that we are having our grill. The proceeds will be going to our kitchen renovation, but let us now close in prayer. Now may the Spirit of God surround you. May the peace of God be in your heart, and may you share that peace with each and every person you meet. Amen.